as, as I've been thinking about our new hospital name, Advent Health, it's got me reflecting on that word, Advent. The idea of Advent is really at the core of who we are, who our identity, what our identity is as Seventh-day Adventists, and it was a recovered truth back when, uh, when our great Advent movement was proclaiming it. You see, most people weren't really focusing on the Second Advent. They were thinking, oh, we're going to have a, a thousand years of peace before the Second Coming is going to happen. So we know that, that even, we haven't even had year one of that, so we don't even have to worry about the Second Coming. And the Great Advent Movement unearthed this lost, amazing truth that Jesus is going to part the clouds any time now. It's going to be sometime soon. We don't know exactly, but it is not very far off. And this Advent movement resulted in who we are today. Seventh-day Adventists. And when people ask, now, now what, what is that name? What, what, is it, what is it about that name? I can tell them that part of the name just means that we are firm, excited believers in the second coming of Jesus Christ, the second coming. You see, the second advent is the culmination of all our hope and longing as Christians. It's known as the blessed hope in the scriptures. However, in my study, I have been struck with how God's advent actions aren't just confined to the two great advents that we usually think of. You see, there's the first advent when Jesus came as a, as a human being, and the second advent. But you see, the, the, the God's advent actions aren't just confined there, because what does the advent mean? What does it mean? It sounds like a fancy word, but advent just means the coming or arrival of somebody or something, right? The advent of electricity. Uh, and, and of course the advent of God. You see, this advent has been lived out since the very beginning of humanity's existence. God chasing after His people, coming to His people when His people were far from Him. He didn't wait for us to crawl our way back to Him. No. He came to us. You see, when we think back at the very beginning, where God and man had separation, our fault, we usually think of this Garden of Eden time as a time when, of cursing and banishment from the Garden. But you see, the key to this event is that God came. God came. It's not banishment, it's that God came. When people ran from him, he came into the garden and he said, Guys, where'd you go? We usually hang out at about this time every day, and I'm just kind of wondering why you missed our appointment together. Can we spend some time? It wasn't just one of cursing, it was one of promise. You see, after the fall, God did not leave his people separated from him. Forever. No. No, you see, in this great, amazing time is something known as the, uh, as the uh, let's see if I can get this right, the Proto-Evangelion. You know, the first gospel proclamation in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to Satan now. Huh? Between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, in this time of great despair, God came. He came to his people. And even though he could not take away all the despair, he gave them a promise. God promised to overcome the power of evil that tempted Adam and Eve to separate themselves from Him and restore them to Himself. And He would do this through His Advent plan, His Advent actions. When I think of promise, 
during the time of separation. I think of my friend Tony when I was in college with him. I shared a, a room in an apartment with him. And, and the year before, he had been gone all year long to Argentina. And he was single when he went down there, but he was not when he came back. You see, he found himself a wonderful young lady. They are now married and living in Idaho, of all places. Um, very far away from here. They started off in Florida. But when he left, they were a little bit sad and concerned because they were going to have a long time of separation before they could be together again. And my friend, being the great guy that he is, he knew he wanted to marry this gal. And so he proposed to her before he left giving her a promise, don't worry, I may be leaving physically here for a time, but I promise that one day we're going to be together again. I promise. And in the meantime, they talked on the computer almost constantly. I had to be careful walking around my apartment because Skype was always on. Always. <laughs> so, she would... She would be sitting on the kitchen table sometimes, <laughs> you know, looking out. He might not be there, and so I didn't know. There were many a time I had to fall onto the floor because I did not want us to see each other at that time. You see, God, God made a promise. God made a promise to his people. Yes, you may not be able to see me face to face, to walk with me in my glory, until much later, but I promise to you that this will not be forever. It won't be forever. See, I will overcome. But from there, there are all these amazing actions, God coming in, uh, you know, with, with his angels to Abram and, and uh, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. He would talk audibly to his people. But the next amazing thing that, that I'm just really struck with as far, as far as God's advent actions are concerned is in the Old Testament with the people of Israel in the book of Exodus. Exodus 13, 21 through 22 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and they, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. God decided to veil His glory in a cloud so that He could travel with His people and bring them to the promised land. He had to hide it because, it, I mean, they couldn't have lived if He shone forth His full glory. And God clearly uh, told this to Moses in chapter 33, verse 20, he, when Moses said, I want to see your glory. God said, oh, sweet Moses, <laughs> my little boy, you have no idea what you're asking. But I'm going to do a little uh, um, pared down version, a little veiled version for you. He said, but you can't see my face or you'll be in trouble. You'll be toast if you try to see my face. No, you can't see my face and live. But see, God didn't just want to float around in a cloud. He wanted a place to dwell with them in their journey through the wilderness. And he gave them an absolutely astounding command. You know this verse. Exodus 25, verse 8, he says, Let them make me a what? A sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And you know, their camp was all organized to where God was in the center and everyone else was flanking him. God wanted to be in the center of the life of his people. His tent was the main tent right in the middle of all of the action. God wanted to be with them. He longed to be with His people. Even though He couldn't be with them physically, He wanted to show them, I have not left you. I may be in a pillar of cloud and fire, but when we're not moving, I've got my own little house right here. I am with you. Later, it was evident, of course, by many miracles that God was with them, doing all sorts of wonderful things. But see, would you say that God was with the Israelites? Yes. But was it like the Garden of Eden? Not quite, right? No, not like the Garden of Eden. He couldn't, his people couldn't safely come before him like in the Garden. 
because they couldn't live. If they saw him, humanity's condition was still so sinful. They were unable to handle his presence. But God continued to work through his plan to bring them back to him. His advent was happening, making this happen in at least a partial way, coming to his people. He came to be with them. You see, but God said, no, a building, no, no, that's not good enough for me. Oh, no. I can't just have a building where only one person can come in to the most holy place one time a year and see me. That's, that's not good enough. See, I need to get a little bit closer to my people. See, the pillar of cloud and fire, the sanctuary, no. In the New Testament... There's something that is even more astounding, really the, the most amazing action that has ever happened in the history of all creation. You see in John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then something incredible was said, and the Word became one. Flesh. The word became what? Flesh. flesh? You mean like my flesh? Yes. The word became like a human being and dwelt among us. You know that, that word dwelt is and tented, tabernacled among us. It's calling back to that sanctuary. Uh, God is saying the word became flesh so that he could truly pitch his tent just like us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. We move down through the ages after many, many years of tabernacle and temple and all this glorious, uh, these glorious edifices that were eventually destroyed. But see, this event in history is the central part of God's plan of reconciliation. Matthew 1, 21 through 23 says, She, meaning Mary, will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. For what is he going to do? He's going to save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name a little tricky, this part, Emmanuel, that's right. I'm not trying to trick you, but I'm being tricky, sorry. And it says it means God with us. God with us. In my time of learning to work in the hospital, um, I had some time in Orlando, and they have a lot of different intensive care units in Orlando, and one of the most heartbreaking intensive care units is the NICU, where the little babies are. And there are some times when the babies are on such a razor's edge of whether they're going to survive or not that the parents cannot touch them at all. They, they can, you know, uh, sometimes they have to wear gloves. They, they can't even hold them. And, and, and it's heartbreaking for the parents. But, but see, they try to get as close as they possibly can to their babies. They're there with them. They might not be able, as Jesus could, to just come in His explosive, amazing glory, but they veil the journeyness as much as they as much as they have to, and touch and connect with as as much as they are possibly allowed, because they don't want to hurt their little baby. They want they want it to survive, but they also want the little one to know, Mom and Dad, we're here for you. We're with you. We're going through this experience just like you are. And Jesus wanted to come and, and wrap himself up in humanity so that he could go along the journey with us and get absolutely as close to us as he possibly could. See, no longer would God dwell in the tabernacle in the cloud, but a human body that could be touched. I envy those disciples so much. What I would give to be able to just give Jesus one hug in the flesh. Wow. Now God in this time could be seen face to face. Children could sit on his lap. Forgiven sinners could embrace him. And murderers could kill him. 
God became vulnerable by becoming flesh, and he was killed for it. But that death opened up the door for him to, to complete the restoration that he had begun in the very beginning. Jesus made a bridge across the great separation uh, sin created and made a way for people to be spiritually connected with him. He atoned for the sins of mankind. But were things back to how they were in Eden? Were things exactly how it was before the fall? No, that was pretty amazing. Jesus coming in the flesh. But it wasn't fully there. But God wasn't done yet. God wasn't done with his advent power. No, it says... When Jesus was about to go to the cross to die, he gave them a message. He knew this was going to absolutely crush his disciples because they did not totally understand what was happening, and he was concerned for them. He tried to give them a heads up, and I tell you what, I, we, we, I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at those disciples and I, and I say, come on, guys. Man, he tried to tell you to the T what was going to happen. And you just say, yeah, sure, whatever you're talking about. So anyway, Peter, no, I'm going to be the greatest. Shut up. I'm going to be the one on top here. I'm going to sit next to... And Jesus just kind of has to, you know, I'm glad he had patience. But I just realized, probably if I were in their situation, not having the benefit of hindsight, I would have, it would have been 30,000 feet above my head too. But he says to them in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. Now that doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. But he's saying, it's your advantage that I go away. But why? Why could that possibly be a good thing? For if I don't go away, the Helper is not going to come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. You see, the disciples must have wondered why the Helper, earlier identified as the Holy Spirit, would be better for them than Jesus in the flesh. What could be better than having God where you could just touch Him and hug Him and, and, and have Him right with you? Well, the only thing that could be better is that Jesus, God's presence, could be with every one of His people in a very powerful new way than ever before. You see, Jesus at that time was stuck, planted in that flesh body, only in one place at a time, but now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, His reach could go into your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in a way that was new. I don't know exactly all of the physics of, of how that was new, but it was. Because we can see when this happened, nothing has been recorded like this before in the Bible with the Holy Spirit's coming in Acts 2, 1 through 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All those people gathered for Pentecost, they started to say, now hold on just a second. How in the world can we be hearing this message in all of our native languages here? Wow. What's going on with these guys? And they said, something special from God is happening, friends. You see, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, God empowered them to do work on a scale hitherto had not happened. Now the Spirit dwelt in them. They went into most of the unknown world at that time. If you look with their limited mode of transportation at all the places where they were able to reach and proclaim the gospel, it is absolutely unbelievable except for the fact that the Holy Spirit was driving this, this train here. Now you see, God could be close to His people in a way that had not been. But of course, was it exactly like it was in Eden? No. Oh, Come on, Scott. When are we going to get to the place where it's exactly like it was in Eden? Well, hold on a second. Just, just relax. You know, don't, don't get upset here. We'll get there. Uh, see, see, God hadn't been satisfied with just being in the flesh. He wanted 
to make his temple that was physical, that was a tent, he wanted to make that temple our hearts. Now he has a temple in everyone. 1 Corinthians 6.19, sometimes we think, we think that it, we kind of relegate it to only taking care of our bodies, which is an important part of this text, but just first think about the reality, though, of God being in you as His temple. 6.19, 1 Corinthians, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? This is how God has been with His people since the first century A.D. to now. God is closer to you than He has ever been to a group since the fall. You are living in an incredibly amazing time. And sometimes it's easy to think, oh, but all the miracles of this and that aren't happening. But, but you have a special place in history of being temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure the Holy Spirit filled the hearts of Adam and Eve in a special way, but they could see God in, in all His glory face to face, and we still can't. But one day that will change. You see, one day my friend Tony went back after doing all of the work to get his lovely wife a fiancé visa to come to the United States and live. See, see, after he prepared a place, come on, after he prepared a place for her, he went back and took her with him and made her his wife. I was in their wedding, beautiful. I, was, I got to be his, his best man. I was kind of best man on standby because his brother, he thought he owed his brother an obligation so he would be the best man, but his brother was kind of, you know, interesting person and didn't even come. So, I was the best man, <laughs> hallelujah. Um, he went to go get her and now they are together. See. We read it in our scripture reading, didn't we? In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, this hasn't happened yet, guys. But this is our blessed hope, remember? This is in our name. It's in our very identity. And I think so often that now because so many Christian groups believe, obviously, in the second coming. I mean, I, most of all of the Christian groups I talk about, I say, oh, yeah, of course, the second coming. I don't know. Uh, we might have a, a unique way of looking at it, but, but because it's not such a lost thing anymore, sometimes we can say, oh, sure, second coming, that's great. Looking forward to it. But this is part of our identity. It's who we are. And we are putting this word, Advent, on all of our hospitals because we want people to know what our hope is. We want people to know the kind of hope that and healing and wholeness that we can bring through the power of God. See, for the Lord Himself, Himself, will He be wrapped in, in, uh, in a way that His glory won't show? No. Oh, no. <laughs> no. He will not hide His glory. He Himself, in all of His glory, I added that part in, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You see, all those loved ones, all the people that maybe we never met in our family, all the people that have gone to rest from our family that we miss so tremendously, they're going to come back because of Jesus. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so... We will, how long? For a few hours? Be with the Lord? Is it a few days? Maybe. Are we going to be lucky and get a year? It's a year, right? How, how long is it? You're messing with me. No, it can't be. It can't be always, right? No. Always. We're going to always be with the Lord. Jesus will return and keep us with Him forever. No more veiled glory. We're going to be upgraded, guys, <laughs> to where we can, handle the, we can handle the glory. No one will have to be in this terrible, sin-darkened world anymore. See, Jesus will take us to heaven, and He's going to remake the world, too. See, I don't even... I, I just think about some of the beautiful scenery that I've had the privilege of seeing in this world, and, and it just... 
and just strikes me. I just am speechless. And this is a post-flood, ruined world. Can you imagine what it's going to look like when God presses the reset button and makes everything glorious like it used yeah. to be? Wow, right? Yeah. Right? In Revelation, this is where everything comes to fruition, guys. Revelation, one of my most favorite texts in chapter 21, 3 to 5. See, I've been told that the, that the Bible is the story from Eden lost to Eden restored. All the stuff in the middle is the rough stuff. And the stuff at the beginning and in the first, you know, couple of chapters and, and at the, the end in the last couple of chapters, that's the good stuff. That's where uh, uh, it was good before and it's going to be good after. Everything in between is just trying to get us to Revelation. See, it says in these verses, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, the tent, the tent, the tabernacle. We, we had a tabernacle in the wilderness. Jesus tabernacled with us in the flesh. And now the tabernacle from heaven, God's city, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. You see, if you think about what it says about the holy city and the dimensions it gives, it makes it like a cube. And you know, you know why they give those dimensions is because the most holy place in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, the dimensions was, was, it was a cube. What this is saying is we get to live in the special place of God's house that only one guy could go into once a year, and he had to do everything just right, and he couldn't stay very long, but we're going to have a residence in that city. We will live in his most holy place with him. Isn't that incredible? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Have you cried at all in your life? I have. He's just going to get that big thumb and wipe them away. No more tears. And death shall be no more. Don't you hate death? I hate it. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for all that has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, John. Are you listening? Write it down, for these things are trustworthy and true. It is going to happen. We may have lost it in Eden. We may have suffered through all these many years as a people. But there will come a day when the tabernacle, the true tent, the true city, the true holy place where God lives is going to come down to this little planet on some far-flung arm in the Milky Way galaxy. And this is going to be the capital city. We will see God face to face. No more death, no more pain. And the most amazing thing about this is not that only that God has brought us through all of this awfulness in the world and gotten us back to where we're with Him in relationship, seeing Him face to face, but technically, God will make it better than it was before the fall. How can that even be possible? Why is it better? Because no one will sin again. See, before the fall, it was always a, there was always a possibility because of, of free will and not going through this experience that some creature would choose to abandon God and bring sin into the universe. But you know what? It says after all of this mess that we're going through, no one is going to do this again. Not one person is going to say, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe I should disobey God again. What do you guys think? 